friends, Jerry Rosa here in the Rosa Stringworks Workshop. We're going to do a fret job on one of these babies. Take a look there, you can see it's an Ibanez. There's what the fretboard looks like. Yes, it's one of those Uncle Les Paul look-alikes. You can see some things that I believe have been changed. I believe the pickups have been changed and I believe the knobs have been changed. Now, I say believe because truly I'm no electric guitar expert at all, as you know. And don't necessarily wish to become one. I, you know, it's not that I have anything against electric guitars. I don't. I don't really want to become an expert on the makes and models of any of them. There's just way too many to become that expert. I don't need to be that guy. It looks good. Everything looks fine. They just want their frets replaced in this case. By the way, I'll tell you the serial number so those of you who get off on that can look this up. I think this is the Lawsuit Era type guitar, I think, but I'm not positive of that. It's a G771308. The 77 probably is the year, the G may be the month. Uh, if you start with A and go through to G and then you'll know, because <laughs> I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> but anyway, um, so all I gotta do is you know, get the frets replaced on it and do a fret leveling and set it up. And he wants it set up, uh, the instructions are to set it up with these strings that he provided, and he wants it tuned down one full step. Okay, I can do that. If that's what you want, that's what you get. In order to remove the frets out of a rosewood fretboard, you really want to take every precaution you can because it's a very brittle wood. Well, even ebony can do this, but but rosewood is a little more open grain and very brittle to boot, and it just likes to chip really bad. I found the best way to get water up underneath the fret is with a fairly saturated rag, not dripping wet, but pretty wet. And you just rub it back and forth, and that water just soaks right under the fret really, really well. That will soften the wood to the point where it doesn't chip as much. And then I'm also going to use the heat trick in addition on this to try to, uh, you know, it alleviate any and all chipping. But to be honest, uh, you know, if we can keep the chipping to a minimum, I, I'll be happy if, I mean, you know, a little chip out I'm expecting. I'm hoping it's just not very much. While the iron is heating up, I just keep soaking this. I'm thinking that that extra heat and steam will help pull the frets out without too much trouble. That's my hope. You never know though till you start. The temperature on that is up over 230 degrees already. I made a new fret pulling tool. I haven't even used it yet. So we'll try it out on this one and see how well it works. And I'll put this on here it's at 250 degrees now we'll start back here at the back end really no chip out there to speak of we're almost up to full temperature on this now starting to hear a little steam now yeah, that's doing a pretty good job. So they're coming out pretty well. I like to work the tool all the way across the fret. You could just grab it from the end and just yank it out of there, but by putting the tool under there and keeping the wood pressed down as I'm pulling the fret up, it seems to chip out a little bit less also. Temperature's up to 380 degrees now, which is the standard that I use. So far, virtually nothing. One little minor chip. The rest of it, I don't see any chips at all. This one has not been heated. I'm gonna just pull it out and see if I see any difference. 
I really don't see any difference and it came out pretty easy. I don't really see anything significant there, although it does look like maybe it's stuck just a little bit right there, but not, not enough to make a big deal. But if that's the case and this helps that sticking, I'll just use this, but I don't know if it's, that one may have been glued in. I don't know. That may have been what the problem was. You're always going to have some damage, but it's not very much. It's pretty minimal. So I think we're in very good shape. Friends, I interrupt this video to say thank you to a wonderful viewer in Plano, Texas. And his name is Andrew. So Andrew from Plano, Texas, thank you very, very, very much. You know what for. <laughs> but let me just show the rest of them what for. What a great pile of deer antler. This is maybe the biggest single pile I've received. It's uh, certainly up there among the biggest piles, if not the biggest. And what this is, uh, for those of you who are not that educated into deer, these are all sheds. And the reason you know they're sheds is because they've turned loose right here at the, at the uh, skull base. What this means is every single year the deer shed their antlers. They just fall off on the ground. Now, Andrew is either incredibly gifted at uh, finding these, which he could very well be, I don't know, or he has some sort of other connection where he can get these things because it's, un it's unusual to have this many sheds brought to you in one, you know, fell swoop like that. So, and they're all sheds. None of these have been cut off. They've all fallen off naturally. So I don't know if uh, Andrew has access to a deer farm or he's just really good at finding sheds. And of course that makes no difference to me. I'm the benefactor. I don't care how he got them exactly. Well, I mean, you know, as long as it's legal. <laughs> but uh, Andrew, thank you very, very, very much. I really do appreciate it. And the rest of you, if you have deer antler and you can turn them loose and send them my way, I'd sure be glad to have them. As you know, we can only use the very base of the antler for the uh, mandolin saddles. Now the rest of the antler can be used for various uh, sundry things, but there's so much of the rest. We have tons of the rest, but only this much right here can be used for the uh, for the uh, mandolin saddles. And on the bigger ones, like this one's right on the edge. You might get two out of this one by splitting it down the middle, but it's right on the edge. So the smaller ones, uh, you can only get one. Like this one, probably only one, maybe two. So, uh, but these are all nice size. There's a few in here that are smaller. This is a little smaller one. And this one was almost sure only one. But there's a lot of them real good size. I mean, some of these are really nice. Really, really big. But every one of them is useful. Every single one of them. Is. And so, I mean, I'm not critiquing them or complaining or anything because nature, nature makes them and nature makes them the way they make them. <laughs> and you got to work with them the way you get them. So thank you, thank you, thank you to Andrew and Plano. I appreciate it, and thanks for watching my videos, too. Friends, I interrupt this video to announce that I have another commission to build another custom guitar. And this one is from Doug in North Augusta, South Carolina. Doug wants a guitar very similar to the one that I built and sent out to California. If you'd like to watch that video, I believe it was number two. 25 if I'm not mistaken and that's by memory and uh, there was about 12 videos in that series I think with an addendum or 11 with an addendum I can't remember but anyway there was 12 or 13 videos and uh, that guitar turned out so awesome um, and of course Doug I'm going to try to duplicate that for you so we'll get started on that uh, series before long and uh, Look forward to it. I hope you'll enjoy that one as well. For calendar purposes, it's Halloween. Why was the skeleton forced to go to school? Because his heart wasn't in it. <laughs> Why didn't the skeleton cross the road? He didn't have any guts. <laughs> Okay, fine. 
All right. I know, I know, I know. Just get on with the music, with the instrument repair. I just spent about 10 minutes making this little rig. I already had a bigger one, but this one's, you know, much too tall for this neck. So I made this small one. I thought it'll come in handy in a lot of ways. I can keep this underneath the fret that I'm driving in. I can slide it back and forth like so. That makes, you know, helps a lot. When I'm way up here, I need additional support back back here at the end because it's can cantilevered, of course. Anyway, the point is that this will work to move along these frets and I'll be driving directly down on there. I have leather on this and when I get back to the very back, back here, I can turn this down flat and drive into a hard surface this way. So it's gonna be very handy for these electric guitar necks. Um, I haven't done a lot of electric guitar necks in the past, so I didn't really have a need for anything like that. The fret wire I've got is about the same size as what was in there originally. This is fairly heavy fret wire. I want to uh, put a little bit of uh, curl to the wire, just mostly because um, you know it's easier to keep the fret ends down. If there's a little bit of an arch to the fret wire, then the fret ends stay down better. Um, this is not a real arched board. It is arched, but it's not a lot of arch to it. And I say arched. I know people get on me because I should be calling it radius. You know, they love it when you use the exact right term for them. You know, it doesn't matter if you understand what I'm talking about. But anyway, so it is a radius board. Um, I'm just going to lay the radius on here and... That matches it pretty close right there, but I'm going to go further because I like to have those ends held down a little bit. So I'm going to run a couple of pieces through here because I know it's going to take more than one piece. Again, I just run it through by hand. I, I could put a crank on this, but I don't really see the need to go to that detail. Crank it down just a little bit more, run them through again. I know you can't really see what I'm doing, but I'll try to turn it around here. I just run it through like so. Like you can see the difference there in the curl, I think. Um, you know, so, cause this one's been through one extra time. So I'll run this one through now and then they should match. Or pretty close to it anyway. Let's see if they do match now. Yeah, pretty darn close. You know, within a couple millimeters anyway. All right, so I think that's probably enough arch. I want to see a little bit of an arch over the fretboard. I see a little bit of an arch over the fretboard. So as long as I'm not flat on there, I mean, I think that's good enough. I might change my mind and want to do more here in a minute. But right now, we're just going to get these frets going in there and see how it works. I've got my fret end nippers here. And we're going to nip off the tang that's going to so that the top can stick out over the binding. That cuts off the little tang there, you can see. That's what we're cutting off because the top part of that has to go extend out over the binding. you can see my process I think uh, to shorten the video a little bit I'm just gonna skip ahead and we'll show you what it looks like when we're finished there you have it and if you left it like that you wouldn't have any fingers left after you played a couple tunes on it because they're sticking out and they are sharp so we have to smooth all that down and these are heavy frets I don't know if these little cutters are gonna do it I may have to go to something heavier they look like they'll cut off a pretty good chunk. But I will want to wear some safety glasses because these are it's throwing little chunks everywhere.
The good news is they're all cut off as short as I can get them. The bad news is almost every single fret, on the, especially on the treble side and a few on the bass side, the ends are up. That's never good. You're gonna, we're going to have to hold them down and glue them in place and that's going to be a lot of extra work. decided to do is go ahead and finish up this part here and get it real smooth and everything and then put it back in the guitar and the reason is I'm gonna to have to do a lot of in work and it keeps wanting to tilt on me and if it's in the guitar I can press on these edges and it'll lay flat it won't keep twisting like this so I'm just gonna work on this end and then put it back in the guitar and then finish it up that way I'll take a little sandpaper to this now and that'll get rid of those extra sharp little nubbies that you can still feel, but they're not much. They're, there's just very little there now. Got a little piece of 600 and I'm just gonna go across the ends of these frets up here at this end right now. I'll do them all later, but right now I'm just cleaning up these just so I can put it back in the guitar. I think that feels okay. I'm gonna clean up my mess and put the neck back on it. Well, this feels much more natural to me, having the neck back on the guitar. Uh, everything is more solid. It doesn't rock around, move around so easy. Yeah, the, taking the neck off is real good for some things, just like putting the frets in. But uh, when it gets down to the fine detail, I feel much more comfortable this way. Better, but still not satisfactory to me. So, some more work to do yet. Smoothing them off, they still feel rough on the ends to me, even though they're a lot better than they were. They don't feel like I want them to feel yet. I think part of it's because they're sticking up, so I think I'm gonna, next thing I'm gonna do now is go ahead and do the CA glue thing and hold these down and glue them. A lot of work, pain in the neck, but it's gotta be done. Well, that was simple. Not. It's the old ugly duckling syndrome. You can see the glue on the ends of all of the frets. And that all has to be cleaned up, of course. But at least now they're stuck down and they're solid. You know, it, and even if it doesn't stick them down, it fills the gap and it keeps them from moving. You know, I mean, it does stick them down, don't get me wrong, but, but it does keep them stationary. So when you're filing on them, they're not going back and forth and chattering. And, you know, when you're trying to get the height set, they're not up and down floating. And so it just makes the fret job a lot better fret job when you've got that problem. These, you know, these rosewood fingerboards do that quite often because the road, rosewood is not as dense as the ebony. The ebony doesn't do it as much. You will find it in the ebony too, when, especially if they've been replaced a bunch of times. But now at least we're solid and we can move forward. So the very first thing I do once I get solid frets in an instrument is I do a fret leveling. I'm gonna make sure I'm not gonna hit the pickup. I'm not gonna hit the pickup. You know, people are concerned about these filings getting in the pickup. You know, I don't want that to happen, obviously, but I don't think it's a big deal because they're not, um, you know, magnetic. But uh, I'll go ahead and just tape off from the front of this back, just in case. Plus, that way I won't scratch it. The scratching part is more what I'm concerned about. And they feel pretty level. I don't feel any one high spot anywhere. Gonna look down them real good just uh, for my own benefit to see if I see anything abnormal. Not really, they look really good. 
they look really flat so when we get them leveled out and recrowned they ought to be just about perfect when you put the string tension on there there'll probably be a tiny bit of relief This is the point where most people put, you know, magic marker over the fret to make sure they filed them all. I have very good close-up vision. I typically just look at them and I can tell if they've been filed. Um, so, you know, if you need to do that, you should. I can tell you they feel much better filing them now. They feel solid now compared to the way they were before. All right. I'm going to work them all over with the recrowning file and we'll show you what we have when we're ready to clean this all up. Well, I didn't click the camera twice, so I'll just tell you what I did. I had the 400 wet or dry. I went across the ends mostly to get rid of the, any more roughness on those ends, and I did it on both sides. Then I just really quickly went up and down the frets like this, and they're really shiny now. You can see how shiny they are. Now, the rest of the fretboard looks horrible, and that's okay, because we're gonna go through with a single edge razor blade. We had to do that anyway to clean this fretboard up. Even if I hadn't glued the frets down, this one needed cleaning up, because you can see there's just lots of wear and marks and scratches and things. Like, there's a, a big scratch across right in here, and I have no idea why that's there. I didn't do it, I know that. But anyway, so we're just gonna clean all of that up with single edge razor blades, or at least make a valiant effort. And uh, I hope we can get it all cleaned up. I think we can. You know, there must have been something going on here because there's a scratch here, and then there's scratches across this one too, and even one fairly good scratch right here. Now this mark here, I did do that with my aluminum, but it's not a big mark, it'll come right out. But, um, you know, this stuff in here, I don't know what all that is, but it's it's time that we get rid of it, so here we go. The other problem with this is this big inlays, they're hard to they're hard to scrape. Now where these lines are going straight across, I have the turning I'm having to turn the razor blade at an angle so that I don't get caught down in those grooves. Once I get rid of them, I can go back to straight across. And I think I got rid of them there. Hopefully you can see the first four frets cleaned up compared to some of the back frets back in here. Well, that looks Real nice. Now, the ugly duckling thing has gone away. It's still not as pretty as it will be after we oil it, but it looks pretty nice. Hopefully you can see what it does when you oil it and just makes it look so much better. And then they even look better, in my opinion, once, you're, once they're actually dry. But anyway, we're just going to oil the whole thing now. And yes, I know there's all kinds of oils out there. I use linseed oil. It's what I've been using for all these years and it works good. I see no point in changing. Yeah, that feels good now. You don't feel any, any roughness now. So let's bring it up here where you can see it. So Les Paul can stop fretting over his frets. I don't plan to really do a heavy duty buffing job on this, but there is a lot of little wear and tear, and so I'm just going to get into it as much as I can with what I can get into with this rag, and I think it'll look a lot better. I don't want to take it all apart and get into a bunch of work. I just want to try to make it look a little better. It didn't, you know, change the world, but it looks a little better than it did, I believe. I'm not going to do anything on the back. Just trying to make it look halfway decent. We'll string it up now and show you what it sounds like.
Good news is we get her strung up. The bad news is it sounds kind of bad. Uh, the reason is it's buzzing pretty much everywhere. The action is really super low and in addition to the fact that it's really low, he wants it tuned down a whole full step. Not a half step, but a full step. So in other words, this is a D instead of an E. Well, it's difficult to do that and keep your action super low, you know. I don't think it's even possible. So I think we're gonna have to raise the action a little bit. If we're gonna if we're gonna tune it that low, we've gotta raise the action, I believe. I don't see how it would, be, would physically be possible to do it any other way, especially as low as this action is. This action is very low. That's a medium pick, and you can see it's holding the pick way down here, you know, and that's a medium pick. That's not a thick pick. <laughs> so <laughs> that's really low. I mean that's can't be more than about 30 thousandths right there, if it's that much. So that's just ridiculous. Uh, we're going to have to go up with the action a little bit to get it to play, I'm sure. So I'm not going to bother you with that. Uh, I'm just going to raise the action up here to what I think is reasonable, where it doesn't buzz, and then we'll see where we're at. Just for, you know, giggles here, you can see that's 28 thousandths. That's what that pick is. So that's how low the strings are. 28 thousandths is beyond ridiculous. So we're going to raise it up. Uh, we're going to try just around 50 thousandths or something. Well, my friends, we've got it set at about 50 thousandths on the treble side here at the 12th fret, and we've got it set about 60, 65 thousandths on the bass side. That's about as low as I've ever set one up. Let's see if we can play it at all. It seems like it's okay. pretty dang low though I mean let's see here it'll well it'll hold that 30 thousandths pick at the fifth fret that's pretty dang low <laughs> for a guitar yeah well and it's tuned you know a full step low that's another thing to keep in mind on this. Now, if you got on it really hard, it'd probably buzz a little bit. But it's not too buzzy. It's really pretty good, really. So that's about as good as I can do on it. Again, not being an expert in electric guitars, I don't know if that's kind of normal or not. That seems pretty low to me. I don't see how you could hardly play one much lower. Threw one of these cheap old capos on here, that's all I had handy. Since it's tuned down a full step, I have to capo up two frets to do it in the key I would normally do this in. I'm going to do one of my own songs because YouTube steals the money away if I don't. And I don't think they're stealing it, they're giving it to somebody else, but uh, either way I don't get it. So I want to, as much work as these videos are to put out, I want to keep my own revenue if I can. I'm sure I've probably done this song before. It's called From Where I Stand. It's a song I wrote. I was actually going to send this to Marty Robbins, but uh, as a young guy when I wrote this, I never did get around to sending it to him, and then he died, and there you go. From where I stand, I can see all the lights of the city. And to love one woman so much it's a pity From where I stand I can see the canteen as she goes to Where she's not supposed to But goes anyway From where I stand I can hear the music and laugh That's what her young heart is after. I see.
see it differently. I see her there with a man. Camilla is lying. I see it from where I stand. Camilla is lying. I see it from where I stand. Well, that cheap little amp I have doesn't make this thing sound any better but uh, you know it's it plays good it's uh, you know I'm sure it's gonna sound absolutely fine when you get it on a good amp and all that kind of thing I'm sure the customer is gonna be quite happy with this because I don't know how you could get it to play any lower especially tuned down a full step I hope you enjoyed it thanks for taking a look <laughs>